Good day and welcome to this webinar, which is about improving writing in religious education for pupils in the primary years. So we're going to take examples from Key Stage 1 and from examples from Key Stage 2 and have a look at the ways in which good writing can really help pupils with their RE learning. I wanted to begin by saying that I think religious education can make really important contributions to how pupils uh, use their extended writing skills. Uh, also, they're looking at the moment for ambitious RE, which is rich in subject knowledge, and uh, I've always been in favour of that as an RE advisor and when I used to be an RE teacher. And the opportunities that we have in RE to engage pupils with Bible, Quran, Quran, uh, a cultural capital in action, and there are also great opportunities for looking at story and precept and rule and all kinds of different genre of writing. I'm saying this. In RE, teachers need confident planning so that people spend time using their growing knowledge of religion and using their creative imagination to write in depth and to do that with accurate, expressive, creative style. So I've got 15 practical ideas to show you. Uh, all of these are examples of children's work and uh, they show a task that you might like or could adapt and they show an outcome, something that a child actually did with the work which uh, I think is the most practical way to go about dealing with this topic so that you can see that the ideas I'm offering you are real and have practical classroom application. As you look at each piece of work, keep these two questions, if you will, in mind. What did the teacher do so the kiddie could write like this? What features of quality extended writing are there in each example? Remember what I said there? Uh, plan confidently, enable pupils to use their growing knowledge and their imagination to write deeply, uh, extended and with accuracy and expression and creativity to do writing like that in RE. In many schools, that's not what happens in RE, where pupils use quite a narrow range of writing skills. So I wonder if through the webinar, you'll get ideas to make changes in your school RE approach to writing. Here's the first example. This is five-year-old Isaac and he has been to a church visit and he was asked while he was there, some people say this is where you meet God, uh, if you could ask some questions about being here, let's use an inquiry word for an acrostic, W-H-A-T, what, then what would you ask? And Isaac's questions are actually addressed to God. What was it like? Have you seen me? Are you real? And the last one is a statement. The church is big, his observation. I think that uh, because he's made those questions up, and he's only five years old, good lad, uh, then those show a variety of questions about religion for himself, that's an appropriate outcome for a father. Sometimes in religious education, we don't give pupils quite the freedom that Isaac has had here to come up with their own material. The RE is always about children reading for themselves. I wonder what you're doing with your year one little young writers. Stuff like this, consider whether that's a good approach. Here's my second example, and it's a bit similar in some ways. Uh, Aaron, age six in year one, uh, school from Nottingham. He, he's also interested to ask God questions. He's got four. How was you made? How did you make Jupiter? How did you make water in the sea? How did you make the moon and the sun? And uh, that task is a, a, a bold one. It's not in the context of a church visit. It's just in the classroom. What would you like to ask the person who knows everything? Of course, that's had some wraparound discussion for the children, but uh, Aaron can do it. I think his... Uh, uh, questions two, three, and four are basically the same question, aren't they, that are about God making so. But the first question, that's a really profound question. If God made everything, as children are often here, uh, how was God made? Question. Here's my third example, also from year one. And this is Olivia, and she's been studying Buddhism. In her study, uh, she's had the opportunity to learn about how Buddhists want to behave. And so she's done that by filling in a column here in relation to six little pictures, six clip arts. What would you do if somebody had a sore knee, if children were arguing? And you see in the third picture, someone is stealing from a shop. And in the fourth picture, someone's caring for a dog who is injured. The fifth picture is of a burger and the sixth of a pint. And this is actually a sophisticated bit of thinking that Olivia is being asked to do here. What would a Buddhist do at each of these things. If the Buddhist found someone with a sore knee who hurt their knee, they take the boy uh, to, to the store and get a pastor. 
And if people are arguing, the Buddhists would ask them to stop it. And if somebody was stealing from a shop, the Buddhists might ask themselves, can I help them sort it out? Look after the dog because the Buddha said so. They would not eat the burger because it is, they are vegetarian. And the Buddhists would say to stop it, the people who are fighting. Olivia has not been just asked about the Buddhist worldview here. But she's got the chance to express some uh, bits and pieces of her own worldview. So what would I do? I'd tell a teacher. That's a common answer. I'd tell the police about the stealing. Uh, I'd give the dog some medicine and care for it. When it comes to the burger, I'd eat it all. Notice there that Olivia's piece of work is quite sophisticated, isn't it? And what she has written has been very much enabled by the gold box writing frame that the teacher has provided and the little stimulus that is given through the clip art pictures. The pupil's answers in the second column relate to prior learning about the Buddha, but uh, she hasn't here written down very much about the stories that she's heard or the guidance that Buddhism gives to uh, followers of the, the way of the moon. Even so, for a year one pupil to be able to remember and uh, deploy that rich knowledge of Buddhist understanding is a high achievement for a I wonder if uh, you give your pupils opportunities to do the two skills, uh, uh, the recall uh, knowledge and the deploy knowledge, the, the deploy understanding that uh, Olivia has been asked to do. Here's our fourth example, and this is uh, from a whole class really. You can see some individual children have done their work here. But uh, the pupils have been learning about the Jewish understanding of God, and they've been asked to do some sentences that include the two starters, I believe, Jewish people believe, Jews believe. And that's a contrast. It gives the pupil the chance to express their own idea and opinion, but it also gives pupils the chance to recall and deploy the knowledge they've got. On the top left of the first page of this floor book, you can see uh, that the pupils have picked out phrases here, keywords, which people use, Jewish people may use, and others, thank God. So Jewish people may say God is powerful, God is kind, God is real, God is good, God is amazing, God is true. Other people may say, no, don't agree with that. For me, God is imagined, God is false. But uh, the sorting of the ideas so that the correct ideas are associated with Jewish visions of God is a clear part of what the learning is, is uh, asking for here. And on the second page in the floor book, there's two or three of them on the, uh, on the first page, but on the second page there are more. Uh, the pupils have said, I believe, and then Jews believe. So the examples we've got there, I believe God is amazing, Jews believe God is creator. I believe God is special, Jews believe God is I believe God is imaginary and not real. The work has related to stories that our uh, children heard, stories from the book of Genesis about uh, Abraham and Jacob and from Exodus, uh, stories of Moses, in which the voice of God plays a key part. God is a key character in the novel of the first five books of the scriptures. And the work was uh, from a unit called Who is Jewish? How did Jewish people choose to live? Did you notice that in this example, I'm not offering any extended unity. Uh, I'm just offering single sentences, but I think these are intellectually demanding uh, of six-year-olds, and I like the way in which they have been asked not just to say it, but to write it as well. I think that's a good functional use of writing in RE because it gives the teacher evidence of what's going on in the children's head. I wonder if you could use a task like that with your, your ones to show some things. Here's uh, my fifth example this morning, and this is from Sam. He's been learning about the Sikh religion. And I think Sam's a, a really good young poet uh, from the age of six. Uh, the stories of Guru Nanak that they'd encountered gave children a chance to work out what kind of person he was. And in this work, um, Sam shows that you can give examples of what Sikh people believe about Guru Nanak and their attitude towards Nanak as a key leader in the Sikhi tradition. It's an acrostic poem, that's clever in itself. It gives him a little structure. He, he needs to come up with eight thoughts here, and perhaps that helps that he's done it because he's got the letters G-O-O-E-N-E-S-S. Guru -E -S -S. Nanak is good and kind, obey the laws of your religion. Occupied was Guru Nanak, disciple to good was Guru Nanak, never disobeyed God, everyone was his friend. 
Sikhism was his religion, special was good. Now, the acrostic poem has forced the syntax in some ways there, hasn't it? And the point about the piece of writing that I think makes it high quality is that he has eight thoughts. I think the third line is, uh, is weaker. Uh, the others all make good sense. They all make uh, key points about the way in which Danak is uh, not a model, uh, an exemplar of the Sikh faith. You notice that we've got lots of different kinds of uh, generic writing going on here for pupils in Key Stage 1. And too often in RE, I'd say, what pupils are asked to write 5 to 7 is very simple answers to questions, sometimes retelling stories. There's a space for those two kinds of activity, those two kinds of writing, but the range of what I'm showing you suggests that to be inclusive and to deploy all of pupils' emerging literacy skills, their writing skills in religious education, then teachers need to be imaginative and creative in the writing tasks that they set. This pupil has been uh, learning about the story of Exodus from the Jewish and Christian Bible and writes, I think, with style about the ways in which the story has an impact. Long, long time ago, when the Egyptians were building their pyramids, a mum had a baby. I'll type it up for you. Uh, his name was Moses. His mum put him in the water. When he'd grown up, he ran to another country. Moses saw a burning bush. God told Moses to bring the people. The style and flair of this piece of writing is uh, delightful, and I like the way in which the teacher has set it up using a clip from BBC's Religions of the World animated versions of the story that I made a, a few years ago with the BBC. The children have seen the story and picked out some key points from it. But instead of writing into a writing frame, this pupil has enough talent uh, and enough grasp of what it means to do a piece of quite extended writing. That's the longest one I've shown you, isn't it? Uh, maybe compared to Olivia's one about the Buddha, but this is the longest piece of continuous writing. And the pupil is able to recall and retell the outline of the story with, I'm saying, I think you'll agree with me, a little bit of style, a little bit of. Okay, at this point, I'm going to suggest that you pause uh, the webinar and you take a, a pencil and paper and you just think about the ways in which my key stage one examples might challenge or develop current practice for five to seven RE writing. I think I've shown examples in which the religious content of what children might about is pretty strong. Questions of God, the nature of the leadership that Guru Nanak offered, the story of the Egyptians, the applied ethics of the Buddha. And I'm very interested in the ways in which RE writing should be distinctively RE focused. We're not just doing another literacy lesson here. Uh, to be honest, we have plenty of literacy lessons. What we're doing here instead is religious education's purposes, aims, and intentions clearly in practice. The recording of this is in lots of different ways, from the floor book to the writing frame to the piece of free writing. Uh, it's retelling stories, it's creating poetry, uh, it's asking questions. I think that range of writing is reasonably well illustrated by the six examples I've chosen to show you this morning. So would you pause the video? And would you write down, make a note of your reflections on the examples that I've given the five to seven words? Then we're going to move on and have a look at some work from 79 minutes. Okay, now let's turn our attention to some key stage two work. And this is by seven year old Tom, who's in year three, and he writes about Remembrance Day. He's got a, a photo to stick into his work there which is of a poppy field at sunrise. And his piece of work talks about Remembrance Day. It's held to remember people who sadly died in the war, also known as armistice. How do we celebrate in the UK? On Remembrance Day, people will lay wreaths of poppies on statues and make, and, and make Remembrance Day. Uh, that was first held in 1990, one after the First World War. It's something sometimes known as Armistice Day, and a two-minute silence is a time to remember people who have died in the war for us. When the First World War was ended, then poppies grew. 
Now, he's had some questions to guide his writing there, hasn't he? And there's some correction to do. The teacher has done a bit of that on this piece of work. And in religious educational writing, we're not always looking for uh, the very uh, forefront standards of uh, use of language or structures, or indeed of the punctuation or grammar or spelling. Uh, we'll be wanting pupils to make progress in all of those areas across the curriculum, just as much in RE as they do in English or in history. But here we have a piece of work that I think has the character of continuous description. He's using some new vocabulary, remembrance. Uh, Our mistress, clearly, he's just got a hold of that word, hasn't he? And uh, I like the way in which he deploys what he's got there. It has uh, a little style, doesn't it? That last line, poppies grew in the middle of fields. I wonder what you recognise as good quality writing and good quality RE. You take the next example from Sammy. Sammy is using the diary genre and he's been studying for Easter the narratives of Holy Week and Good Friday. And he writes as from Mary's diary. It's a very sad piece, actually. I can't believe that my son Jesus is there. I feel like I've uh, let him die. My heart is ripped down the middle because he's yeah, whilst crying because I've lost my son. My prayers say, I wish my son was alive. My heart went out. My eyes upsetting. Uh, with them all cheering for my Jesus' death. I feel so heavy in a bad way that I want to kill my son. I can remember him for saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Indeed, very emotional, as the teacher has pointed out in her response to Sally's writing. And I think that the connection with the detail of the narrative of Good Friday is very strong here, including a quotation of one of Jesus' sayings from the cross, such an important expression of Jesus' understanding of his, uh, of his ministry, a test of love, if you will, to pray forgiveness for those who crucified him. I wonder what you'd say was good quality in Sally's piece of that's Tom, seven, and Sammy, eight. Would you look at Hugh, who's nine? Hugh has been learning about Rosa Parks and the civil rights movement in the United States of America in the 1950s. And he's got quite a lot to say there. This is a more extended piece of writing. And again, it's structured and stimulated by some questions, but the questions are not at all closed. They're pretty open in the ways in which they require uh, young Hugh to write. Rosa Parks needed to campaign for justice for people like herself who were being separated from white people and had to do things like giving up their seat for a white person if the bus that they were on was full. Also, black people had to have a different toilet, stairway to those who were white. The unfair part was that people were split up and white people normally had better rights than those who were black. This is really unfair. People can't help what color their skin is. Justice was achieved because the other black people on the bus that Rosa was on spread the word of what she did. That there were black people to not use the buses. And so eventually the bus company ran out of money and that forced the government to make a new rule allowing black people to sit where they wanted. That's uh, descriptive stuff, isn't it? But it's also a clear application of the concept of justice in relation to a, a, a question of human rights. I think that uh, uh, as it stands at the moment, Many religious education classrooms at year four, Hughes in year four, uh, don't give pupils enough opportunities to spend the time it takes to write like this. And I know that religious education is and will remain in relation to English a small time subject, you know, only five hours a week to English and one hour a week to RE. Certainly that's the aspiration. You should be doing an hour a week of RE. But maybe sometimes there's a case for linking uh, the writing objectives in the English curriculum with those in the RE curriculum. Uh, I think that this is a piece of writing that could have been done as part of Hugh's work in English or part of his work in RE. And I just say about that, the story is told of an inspector who asked children who've been studying in, in literacy in English, Jesus's parable of the lost sheep. And the inspector asked a girl, so what have you learned from Jesus's parable of the lost sheep? And the girl said, I've learned that there's a silent B on the end of the word lamb which is a literacy outcome. And it's fine, I'm glad she's learned that. But I don't really think she's got to the heart of the parable of Jesus about the idea that God sees that which is lost. So just notice that uh, if you do link English with RE, good thing to do from time to time, can double up the time, can double the value of the time learning. If you do that, 
then make sure that the RE objectives, which here are to enable the pupil to apply the concept of justice to a civil rights case of the 1950s, uh, that the RE objectives are met alongside any English language objectives that they might be behind the work as well. That's nine-year-old Hugh, and this is 10-year-old Lucy. And Lucy has been uh, writing a, a factual piece here. She's been learning about the bombing of Coventry and the building of the new cathedral in Coventry as a symbol of reconciliation and forgiveness. The learning objective is there for her, and she writes like this, 14th of November, 1940, the Germans bombed Coventry Cathedral, and it went up in flames. They rebuilt the building and made it peaceful, and they found nails shaped in a cross. Also, there was a man called Richard Howard, and he wrote with chalk, Father, forgive. 568 people died in the bomb. Someone made a cross with the beams that were burnt in the bomb. Also, at the end of the new Coventry Cathedral is a big window. So you can see the bomb one next to it. I like the descriptive clarity with which Lucy writes here, and I like the way in which the motifs of forgiveness, which are so important in the story of the rebuilding of Coventry Cathedral, three of those motifs are incorporated into the actual event. How long does it take a child in year five like Lucy to write like that? Sometimes longer than pupils are given in religious education. I think if we uh, if you agree with me that we should find time for quality writing in RE, then you'll perhaps note that uh, the time that is needed must mean that pupils mustn't feel rushed in the writing that they're doing. And too often in RE, the teacher gives out facts, lots of them, the pupils forget them, they don't have time to make an accurate, clear, personally focused written record of what they've learned. That's something that schools can and should put right. I wanted to show you Ella's fine piece of work about commitment. Uh, we have a game, it's a discussion game where people move a load of cards around on a board to say, I'm very committed to this, I'm not so committed to that, I'm definitely not committed to the other. And Ella had played this game with a group of four pupils in her classroom, uh, considering what matters most to me. Afterwards, she was stimulated by that to write about her own commitments in this way. I live in London with my family, mum, dad, sister, dog. I love my family lots, but I'm not good at playing with my sister as she annoys me. I'm going to try and play with her better. My God is very important to me. and Jesus is important to me. I love to go to church as it means that I can get rid of all the bad things I've done and ask God to forgive me. I'm very committed to caring for my dog as I love to walk her, give her treats and basically care for her. I try my best to work really hard and I always do my homework, but sometimes I forget to do it. If I showed this to my parents, I think they would say, this is really good and you are very forgetful. That's quite a charming piece of writing, isn't it? Because it's very personally focused. And when writing about their own commitment, some children don't mention God and religion at all, but Ella does have that to say about her own sense of the value of her membership of the Christian community and her sense of forgiveness, uh, a fresh start that comes from her practice. The piece of writing is, is a pretty continuous piece of prose, isn't it? And really that's not derived from anything other than the discussion that she's been involved in playing the everyone's committed game and her own thoughts, uh, her own ideas about that. I want to ask here, uh, do you provide your pupils with activities that give them the stimulus they need to write thoughtfully for themselves? Great religious education lessons don't often come straight from a textbook. Ever so much more often, they come from an exciting, interesting, engaging piece of dialogue, activity, listening and learning, maybe a school trip, a visit, a visit of a visitor to school, the opportunity to be involved in a dynamic discussion, that's what's happened in this case, and the ways in which that stimulates great writing, particularly the kind of free writing that Ella has done here, are pretty important as a marker of good quality in reading. That's what uh, Ofsted are interested in there, the rich knowledge that comes from substantive learning about uh, the concept of commitment here. Uh, Ella has then put that into a statement, if you will, of her personal worldview. Let's take another one. Uh, this is by Dan. And Dan has been involved in a discussion in which he's selected his top reasons for having religious education on the school platform. I think this is an outstanding piece of writing uh, for a 10-year-old in year five. 
It says, I think that having RE lessons in school really helps you to think about the world and all the people in it. Firstly, you can accept others for who they are and not judge the way they look or their religion. You can learn to do this in RE. Secondly, if you do something kind or good, like making cakes for a charity or giving away old clothes, you can pass that kindness on, spreading it around the world. Learning to respect others is one of the key things you explore in RE. You can be inspired and inspire the people around you to make choices, good choices in life. If we didn't have RE, no one could ask questions and we would judge everyone. It's important to love everyone, no matter what religion or what colour skin they have, and we should all celebrate our differences and act as one. Well. In RE, we can explore and discover, even changing our world to, to improve the lives we lead. You're free to ask questions in RE, discussing problems that you can't talk about in any other way. Sharing your thoughts with others is the best way to learn to accept each and every person. Some schools, the class had learned that in France and America, there's no RE. Some schools don't have RE lessons. And as a result, the pupils judge others. We should all each love each other, not judge it. Same, some people in this world are racist and say black people don't belong in this world. But that's really not true. No one's perfect. And in this world, you don't have to be. You just need to be kind, loving all God's creations and all people, no matter what. RE helps me. It gets personal here, you see. Ari helps me understand about religion, and I know that that will help me in life. I know now not to judge, and that everyone is equal, and has a right to do whatever they want. It's a kind of statement of the intentions of religious education, isn't it? And I've been using this activity to help uh, uh, schools to be Ofsted ready, get the pupils to do a pupil voice approach, uh, an activity that enables them to write like this. In the classroom uh, where this piece of work was produced, this was, I think, one of the best two or three out of the 30 that children wrote about the aims and purposes, the intentions. In our room. I do think it's a very high quality piece of writing, and I think that it comes from some very high quality thinking and some well-led discussion. Ever so often in religious education, the focus of discussion is where the energy for high quality writing occurs. But sometimes the process stops at the end of the discussion and the pupils are not then given time and structure, encouragement and space in which to articulate in writing what they've been thinking and learning. And that's not great because in a class discussion, often you know which five kids are gonna contribute the most or which five kids may speak up if they're feeling good today. But quite often, lots of children in your class don't contribute by speaking in a discussion. They sit and listen and they may well learn from that. So although discussive methods and dialogue are really, really important in our room, I think that they need to be coupled very, very often with writing opportunities. See, if Dan had just been in the discussion, he wouldn't have said all of this, would he? The fact that he's then been given, and this piece of writing took him 30 minutes, the fact that he's got 30 minutes in which to really nail down and exegete his thoughts about the value and purposes of our room, that's good. I think we need more often to use discussion and dialogue, listening and talking as a platform for writing. And I'm gonna say at this point that I reckon good planning for religious education will provide, I don't know, maybe three opportunities during the course of an hour a week, 40 lessons across the course of a year, maybe three opportunities for every pupil to do a piece of their very best writing about a religious topic, a religious and spiritual topic in the context of religious education three in a year. Are your pupils getting that at the moment? Do you agree with me? Would it be good if they had those kind of opportunities? Christopher's 11 and he wants to write to God. And in generic terms, this one gives him the space for a bit of fun. He says, to the almighty, cloud one, and galaxy crescent, heaven, dear God, I hope you will find time to read my letter and better still find time to answer it. I'm 11 and some questions keep puzzling my mind. First, I should like to know why we're here on earth. Some grown-ups have a terrible message. I have no idea what to do with that. Next, I often wonder what is the meaning of life? Some people place so little value on life. Surely that wasn't what you intended. Third, I'm puzzled about outer space. Can you tell me if there are other life forms? And if so, are they all little green men? Lastly, please don't be offended. Are you real? Yours sincerely, Christopher. P.S. If the answer to the last question is no, don't bother having this letter delivered. What do you make of that? 
I think it has two um, moments, thoughts of real profundity. In it. Some people place a little value on them, sure there's not really anything. Some grown ups make a terrible mess of it. They have no idea what to do with it. Those are interesting points from him, aren't they? But has he enjoyed writing it? Oh, yes. Um, from the uh, phony address at the top of the page down to the PS at the bottom, uh, the boy's pleasure flows through this piece of writing. And that's what makes it high quality. Can I ask you this? Do you set writing tasks which children can visibly enjoy? Enjoyable writing instead of uh, meaningless writing. Purposeful writing instead of purposeless writing. Writing that gives space for flair, imagination and creativity, instead of writing that is merely repetitive. Those kinds of writing activities should characterise the best of religious educations. Writing off of the pupils in, for instance, year six, uh, where Christopher is working. I know it's hard to retain all these examples. I've chosen them each one for a reason. I'm trying to elaborate the reasons why they might be worth our attention and consideration as we go along. But in a, in a short while, we'll have a chance to just do a bit of review of what you've been looking at. So you saw Tom on Remembrance Day. Sammy, Mary's Diary of Good Friday. A piece of work about Rosa Parks from Kew. Lucy writing about Coventry Cathedral. Ella writing about her own commitments. Dan writing about why we do RE. And Priscilla's letter to God. Could I again urge you to pause the, uh, the, the, the webinar here? And consider this question, what do these examples imply for your own school in developing better, longer form writing in religious education? I think the examples are, you know, none of them are perfect. They're not meant to be. They're all real. I haven't chosen examples of weak writing, poor writing. I've chosen good examples. Of course I have. But these examples are not far from what your pupils do in the English classroom. In the English lesson, they write well and in extended ways, accurately, clearly, using different genres. I think I'm pretty sure of this, that many religious education classrooms, that kind of writing is not attempted, or if it is, it's attempted in rather hurried ways. So I'm going to advocate that you plan for three opportunities for high quality writing in a year group, in year two and three and four and five and six, the ones a bit different. And if you do that, then the evidence of achievement and progress that you get from doing those pieces of uh, high quality writing with every pupil, maybe three times in the course of the year, will be strong evidence of achievement. As I say, this is a good moment to pause and reflect and make a written note perhaps of uh, what you're learning, what you're thinking, what your intentions might be because of this webinar. Now, uh, some of the pieces of writing that I've shown you, you've been able to deduce from the writing what was the context, what was the task, what was the prior learning. But I wanted to give a couple of examples during this webinar of ways in which uh, good learning is structured towards producing written outcomes of high quality at the end of a sequence of three or four or five lessons. So the first example I have for you here uses uh, Bible writing from the Christian tradition. And it introduces pupils, you might use this table with them and this slide, to uh, the different varieties of genre in Bible writing. The Bible has laws, poems and songs, visions, stories from history. The Bible has made up stories like the parables of Jesus, the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son. And the Bible has letters, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. They are letters from the Apostle Paul and from other followers of Jesus in the first century of Christianity to uh, the churches, the Christian communities, which they were involved in setting up. I wonder if uh, you recognize the examples I've given of the laws, the poems, the visions, the history, the stories and the letters in the broad column there. Those would be some that would be fairly popularly colored. I got my artist, uh, Sophie Hardwick, she's great. I got her to do this illustration of the different biblical genres there. And you'll see there that those genres are often in action. So the songs of the Psalms, 150 chapters in the book of Psalms, the longest 
book of the Jewish Bible and the Christian Bible, uh, those songs are in, in use. They're, they're sung today in Christian communities and indeed in Jewish communities across the world. I wonder if you look at these genres, which ones you cover most in religious education. In the programme called Understanding Christianity, which many teachers, many schools, thousands of schools use that now, in that programme, we've tried to balance the genres of biblical writing used. But sometimes it's the case that you do the Ten Commandments and a couple of stories of Jesus, and maybe Joseph and his amazing technicolor dream coat, but you do less from the Psalms, the songs, the poems of the Bible, from the letters of St. Paul and other key disciples of Jesus, and from the visions, uh, the Book of Revelation, for instance. It's a shame, I think, because there's some exciting work that can be stimulated from each of those biblical genres. As pupils develop their understanding of what Christians get out of their Bible, then it may be helpful to make the links between these genres and pupils' own sense of words that matter. So, for instance, uh, every child will be able to say, I've got some songs that inspire me. They may never have heard Psalm 23 or Psalm 42 or Psalm 150, examples of psalms which inspire me, but I can use the songs that inspire them as an introduction point to studying some biblical song lyrics from the book of Psalms. Most pupils have got some thoughts about the rules and laws that humanity should live by, and stories that they know that are worth telling over and over again. I bet there's someone in your class who knows the entire script of the movie Frozen off by heart, stories they think are worth retelling time and again. All of us, of course, are shaped by our family histories and by our cultural histories and by our national histories. And uh, being aware there of the ways in which the history of the people of God expressed in biblical literature is influential on Jewish and Christian communities. That's a good learning outcome for Mari. And in those letters, St. Paul gives advice to the Christian community about all kinds of different topics and showing the pupils some of that advice and discussing its impact and its value. That would be an important part of getting to grips with that genre of biblical literature. And the visions sections of the scriptures uh, give uh, an idea of the future, perhaps an idea of the future positive. I wonder if pupils think the world is getting better or the world is getting worse. I wonder if they think they can do something to make the world a better place. The visionary writing of the, uh, of the Christian scriptures in the book of Revelation is where I'm going to turn my focus now because I think that is too little studied uh, in religious education. We do the creation stories, do the stories of Moses, the stories of Jesus, we might do a little bit from St. Paul, but the Bible, the arc of the narrative goes from a beginning to an end. And too often, the bits of the narrative that say, this has got a finishing point, it's got a destiny in view, they're ignored. So that's my little picture from my artist, Sophie Hardwick, of the vision that comes right at the end of the Christian Bible in Revelation chapters 20, 21, 22. And uh, the vision is, I've called it a poem when I've read it to pupils, because they kind of know what a poem is, whereas the category of prophecy or visionary writing, or indeed apocalyptic literature, those categories may be fresh to them, and they may divert them from looking at the meaning of this poem. Let me read it for you, same thing. I saw a vision, I saw a vision of the future, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down to earth from heaven, pure like a diamond, clear like a crystal, gates of gold open to all. There's no sunshine. God is the light of that city, never dark. I saw the river of life flowing out the city and in the centre of the city I saw the tree of life and every leaf on the tree was for the healing of the nations. There was no crying there. Every tear was wiped. Now, first of all, this is no harder than the kind of poetry that pupils encounter in the English curriculum in, say, year four or year five. So don't worry about it being a text too hard. It's real. Second, teach the pupils that St. John, who wrote this in the Bible, had lived in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was a hot, stinky, dirty, dusty, dangerous, thirsty city. Let me tell you a few details there. There's no river in the city of Jerusalem. It's up on a hill. So if you want water, you have to buy it. People carry water up and you pay for it. And if you're rich, you can have plenty of water. If you're poor, you only get secondhand water. Eh, nasty idea. A thirsty city. And what do people do with 
how should we put this, the overnight soil. They throw it out the windows. The streets are full of it and they stink. And the city streets are not irrigated, so the stink goes on all the time. Is there a hospital? No. Uh, is, is there any place to go to get yourself healed? Not really. Is, is it a safe place? No. Did you know this, that one day in 66 AD, the Romans crucified over 900 Jewish rebels on a single day, and they ran out of crosses, so they nailed them to the city walls. A thirsty, dangerous, unhealthy, stinking, dusty city. John's own city. And we saw it transformed. So if you get the pupils to look at the simple little image we've got there of John and the gates of gold and the tree of life and the river of life and the city set on a hill and get them to imagine their own town. I would do it like this, say to the pupils, just fold your arms and rest your head on your hands and close your eyes for a few moments. And I'm gonna read you St. John's poem and then say to the pupils something like this, giving them plenty of time for their imagination. Can you imagine waking up tomorrow morning and finding that your town, your Birmingham, your London, your Sheffield, your town is being turned perfect? What would it be like if you saw a vision of the perfect Birmingham, the perfect London, Sheffield transformed for the good? What would it be like? What would it look like? What would the city be made of? Would it be similar to? Would your city become in some ways like John's vision of the New Jerusalem? What would grow there, would flow there, would heal? Let's say to the pupils, when you open your eyes, I want you to take a piece of paper and a pencil, and I want you to make your first stab at a poem about the perfect Sheffield or the perfect Birmingham. And then I want you to discuss it with a friend, and then I want you to have another go so that you draft and redraft your work. You see what I'm doing here? I just want to illustrate the process by which our high quality writing, uh, and this, I've tried this with children in year four and five and six, I'll show you some examples. Uh, the process is a step process, isn't it? It builds up towards uh, pupils being able to do an excellent piece of creative, imaginative, spiritually focused writing. The outcomes I'm after here are that pupils will consider questions about religion and the purpose of life. For the Christians, the new Jerusalem, the vision of the future in which the kingdom of God comes to the people of God finally for goodness and for community. That's what these chapters are all about. I want children to engage and apply ideas from sacred texts, in this case, the book of Revelation, and express their own ideas. What's the perfect Sheffield like? And I want them to do that with increasing depth and with increasing clarity. And in this work, I don't necessarily expect pupils to write about God. In St. John's vision of the perfect New Jerusalem, God is the light of the city. But some pupils don't believe in God. This activity is open. It requires no belief position from the children. Can they express their own values in the light of what they're learning from the religious text that they've encountered? Here is 10-year-old Phoebe's vision of the new Grimsby. It was like a dream, as peaceful as a beautiful as a butterfly. The entrance and archway made of flowers and vines. In the middle, the fountain of love. And round the town stood five trees of hope, peace, respect, kindness and faith. In the river of truth, dozens of lily pads. And every lily filled the town with honesty. And all the people were happy, making friends, helping others. There was no more ill people, no more suffering. All the people's lives were filled with good. Let me show you some more. First one from year four, I saw a vision, I saw a vision of the future where my life was full of love and joy, laughter and smiles on every face, respect and equality spread into everyone's hearts. I have become an, an honest and fun architect. I saw the earth as it is in hell. The pupil uh, from Leicester goes on to write about a land where poverty and wars don't exist where pollution stops and where the climate revives. No crying there, every tear wiped away. And Elizabeth's one from year six, uh, she's from Liverpool. 
I saw the new Liverpool like a whole new world, pure as a crystal. It was a perfect town. The entrance was a silver gate with green ivy and flowing from it the Mersey River, as clean as the water we drink, full of exotic fish, dolphins that welcomed it. In the middle of fountain that the injured could drink from, he healed. Protected by a phoenix that wiped away tears on the sad, on the grass grew the tree of life, the apples so sweet they made you smile. These three examples from Grimsby, from Leicester and from Liverpool, I think are good examples of creative writing informed by the poetry, the vision of Revelation chapters 20, 21 and 22. The children who've written them, age 9, 10 and 11, the children who've written them don't necessarily want to use uh, religious language in what they say. They often use the language of values rather than the language of religion. That's fine. Although the spirituality of these pieces of writing, I think, uh, by any definition of spirituality that you might like to use, is indisputable. Is the writing of high quality? Well, I think so. I like the way that they use and filter quotations. All three of them do it. They take sentences, phrases, words, ideas from the book of Revelation and use those in their own writing. But also, I like the way that they're original. Each one has a sparkle of originality, some stardust of creative thought from the pupils who did it. These pieces of work uh, and the process by which the children have stepped towards doing them are worth spending a few minutes with. I want to ask, I want to challenge you in your religious education practice across the six or seven years of primary RE from reception year one through to year five, six, does your religious education practice give pupils chances like this? Chances to express themselves with depth and profundity, to explore their own values in writing, to use poetry, is this prophecy, vision, whatever genre you want to call it, to use their ability and talents with writing to put this into focus in a religious education context, in responding to the spiritual question, what is a, a, a human community like if it is turned perfect? I wanted next to take an example from the gospel record of Jesus, stimulated by the art of Laura, Laura James. The feeding of the 5,000 by Jesus is a miracle story that occurs in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, all four gospels. So it must be of some importance in the Christian tradition. And it's very, very often been represented in art as Laura's wonderful picture shows. Uh, children might ask about this. Why is Jesus so big? Well, because he's the most important person here. Why has he got long fingers? That's actually a part of the tradition of the iconic art of the uh, Orthodox churches of North Africa, the Ethiopian and Coptic Orthodox churches. And you see that uh, Jesus brings uh, his disciples behind him. They've got little uh, goldish looking halos, two, four, six, eight, 10, 11, 12 of them all together. One of them's cutting up bread with a great big cutlass. And Jesus uh, has given a platter of bread and fish to the, the disciple in the terracotta colored uniform. And then uh, off go the disciples to share the bread and fish with the enormous crowd. There aren't 5,000 there, but count them up, there's quite a few. And look, all of them point with their eyes in one direction or another, thinking, who's gonna get the food here? Is there gonna be enough for everybody? Jesus stands in the river uh, of the fish and shares the bread and fish disciples to the grave. Here's an interesting piece of writing and the pupil who's done this has addressed various aspects of this story. They made a picture of their own there in which the 5,000 are symbolized just by little lines there. I don't think they've got up to 5,000 but lots of little lines and then down the front of the picture two, four, six, eight, ten people drawn in some more detail. Uh, the first thing that the pupil has needed is uh, I think that is to define a miracle. I think a miracle is when a great and happy coincidence happens. It's not suspected or expected, but it happens and it's great and amazing. The people set their own learning intentions. I am trying to explain in detail one of Jesus's miracles, and I will explain in detail what miracles tell us about Jesus, giving my own ideas. Further down that page, uh, feeding 5,000, starving people in a rush, Jesus the one that can help them all. Five loaves, a fish, five thousand people. Jesus looked up to the Lord and blessed the food. Astonishment rose through the crowd. People sat down to have a meal, thankful for Jesus and all they had. 
But how did they know what was coming for Jesus? In the Bible stories, the miracles of Jesus, says the student, uh, show that he is the one and only. He is astonishing and powerful. He does miraculous things in a matter of seconds and is friendly and kind. My opinion on miracles is that they happen. It's a weird and wonderful coincidence in our world. Some are not good, but others are so unbelievable that you start to question yourself. I think that there's uh, a mind on a page in this work. I love the way in which the student is engaging with the whole concept of miracle and meaning. What's the point and purpose? What is this miracle supposed to be saying about what kind of person Jesus is, about his role, about his status? Have a look at the stained glass window, uh, which recalls the miracle of the loaves and the fishes that I've got for you here. And would you notice that in Mark chapter 14, uh, that's the story in the Gospels about Jesus' last supper, he does exactly the same four things that are mentioned eight chapters earlier when he feeds the crowd of 5,000. He took bread, he broke it, he gave, he gave thanks, and he gave it. He it broke it, thanked, gave. Jesus does that when he feeds the 5,000. And then chapters later, facing his own death, initiating a way of remembering him after he's gone. He takes the bread, he breaks the bread, he th gives thanks for the bread, he gives out the bread. If you draw that to the attention of your pupils and ask them, so this window here, is this about the miracle or is it about the mass, the Eucharist, the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, the ritual by which Christians use bread and wine to remember Jesus? Surely it's about both. And that's interesting. Because in the Gospels, there's supposed to be a close focus on the miracle and another focus on the last summer. Here's another piece of writing that comes from this miracle. We asked Nathan's class if he would write the miracle into his own modern context. And he lives in Dunstable, so he wrote this. You might think you don't believe in miracles, but let me tell you what happened last week when Jesus heard what happened in this direction. He left in his car and went to Brewers Hill Middle School. That's Nathan's teacher in his own school. He went there to think. All of the school followed Jesus. He got out of the car and went into the school hall. They had pity for them all, so he cured the ones who were sick. That evening, the teachers went to Jesus and said, it's already late and these children should be at home. Shall we send them home to have their dinners? They don't have to go. You can feed them yourselves, said Jesus. <gasps> all we have here is five sandwiches, two yogurts, three chocolate bars and six small bottles of lemonade, said the teachers. Then give me them, said Jesus. He told the children, sit down on the dusty floor. And they sat down, wondering what Jesus was going to do. He prayed for the food and then told everyone to get into their classes. So they did what they were told, got into their classes, and he shared the food between the classes and told them, eat as much as you want. So they ate and they ate until they could eat no more. And afterwards, they collected all the leftovers and they could fill up 20 plastic bags. So Jesus gave the leftovers to NSPCC. This, I think, is another example of the writing that the pupil enjoys. Can you feel Nathan's pleasure as he parodies, as he does a pastiche, as he takes details from the biblical story and considers, plays around with them, wanders through his mind thinking, how would that be in Dunstable? I like the way that this activity, what if Jesus came to your town, generates uh, engaging, original, in my opinion, sparkling writing, stimulated by a biblical story, stimulated by an artwork and a stained glass window. I want uh, you to use that idea. Take any story of Jesus, the Christmas story, uh, take the story of Jesus' baptism. Where's the local stretch of water where Jesus would call fishermen to be his disciples? Uh, where's, the, uh, where's the place in which his temptations would happen around your town? Where's the place in which he would uh, overturn the tables of the bankers and the moneylenders in a gesture that said, let's have justice and spiritual space for everybody. If Jesus was crucified in one story, if Jesus was crucified in your town, if he rose from the dead in one of your local parks, where would it be? I'd like to get you then to give the pupils uh, a text from the Bible to work from and a, a space, uh, a discursive space, a dialogical space to talk about what would it be like if Jesus came to Sheffield if Jesus came to Nottingham, if Jesus came to Plymouth, what would it be like? Nathan's piece is great, 
But in his class in Dunstable, there were four or five pieces of writing of this kind of length, of this kind of wit and wisdom, of this kind of sophistication. Other children found the activity harder and they wrote much more briefly. But all, I think, in a worthwhile story. As we uh, come towards the end of the webinar, I want to show you a couple of pieces of writing from Natre's recent uh, anti racist religious education project work. And uh, one of the activities we set here is to study the statue of John Wesley in Bristol and the statue of Edward Colston that was pulled down in Bristol in summer 2020. We asked pupils to imagine uh, a conversation between Edward Colston, a slave trader, who was responsible for taking about 80,000 slaves and enslaving them from Africa and on his ships, on his fleet of boats, taking them across to the Caribbean and selling them there. Wesley, of course, was a famous anti-slavery campaigner. He learned from his black friends, uh, from escaped slaves, ex-slaves. He learned what the life of slavery was like. And he formed the view that God uh, required Christian people to work for equality and against slavery. So here we have a pupil imagining Wesley and Colston in conversation. Hello, Edward. I'm John Wesley. You might have heard of me. I think we've got similar interests. Hey, John, nice to meet you. I love Bristol. I'm glad I was born here. I'll tell you about myself. My parents are quite rich, but I actually made my own fortune. Oh, really? Says John Wesley. How did you make that? I'm not actually that wealthy. Wesley was wealthy, but he gave all his money away, so he never had much. But he made the equivalent of about seven million pounds from his book sales uh, back uh, 200 years ago. I'm not wealthy, says Wesley, but I enjoy doing what I do. And I come to Bristol to preach the good news of Jesus, grace of God, power of the spirit, equality and freedom for everyone, especially slaves. Oh, wow. Well, you're um, quite different to me. I, uh, Colston says, made my fortune by, uh, by uh, trading things. Um, I'm a successful sea merchant too. Uh, and, and I give money to, to church, hospitals and schools and money to charities. But I want you to know this says John Wesley, I really dislike the people who treat other people badly, like slaves. That dialogue continues, and um, I wonder if you can see how skillfully uh, this pupil in Upper Key Stage 2 handles the dialogical material and handles the imagined controversy between a person like Colston, a Christian, he built a church with the profits of enslaving people. How does the dialogue between someone like Colston and someone like Wesley is it good to get 11 year olds writing in this kind of nuanced dialogue? I think the sense of constant shame is very well created. Would you say that that was empathic engagement, conceptual understanding of the religious reasons why John Wesley was opposed to slavery? I would. Here's another, and this is from the same sequence of lessons in which pupils hear the story of John Wesley and the story of Edward Colston, and they study those two statues from Bristol. One's still there, one pulled down and thrown in the box. And here the pupil reflects on the question of whether uh, statues of people who've uh, been involved in enslaving others sh should still stand today. They've been asked to write a two-sided argument to this. So the first paragraph that you see here says, I think Britain shouldn't keep statues of slave owners. They may have done amazing things in their lifetime, but it doesn't outweigh the terrible thing. A statue makes it seem like we're praising everything they've done including the bad. It teaches people that you can do bad things and then if you do something good, you can get let off. That's a terrible mindset, especially in modern day society. If we take the racism into the matter, we should take Wesley's advice. Where is the justice of inflicting the severest of evils on those that have done us no wrong? And then the other side, uh, some people may disagree with me and say that we should keep the statues up because we should acknowledge them and not let history repeat itself. And because we need to recognise the importance of Britain's history in general and praise the good that these people have done. But the pupil continues the reasoned argument. This is not a convincing argument for me. I see no reason as to why we cannot just learn about them in history books. If the actions they've done are so amazing, then we should be able to learn about them in school or online. Many people have done amazing things. There's no need to have a statue of a person in slavery. These two pieces of writing 
the first one of dialogue between Wesley and Cost, and the second one, a reflection on whether status of people who, uh, whose primary work in life, whose primary role in life was enslaving, uh, whether their status should still be celebrated, should still exist today. These pieces of work show a high level of critical engagement. Uh, they show pupils able to handle reasonably a difficult question. It's a lively question, isn't it? You can take two newspapers in Britain today and find journalists who disagree about this question. But the opportunity is presented in RE here for pupils to engage with the question reasonably, thoughtfully, with some balance, with some good writing. Now, in all of these examples I've given you so far, I think I can show that RE is making a valuable contribution to pupils' ability to write well. And I think that the examples speak for themselves when they say great religious education writing is not great literacy, it might contribute to that, it's great RE. But let me just pick out a few of the things which you've seen in different examples that we've studied here. Have you seen pupils using drafting processes to improve their writing? Think of the New Jerusalem pieces where pupils draft and redraft, discuss with a friend and rewrite until their poem is great. Have you seen pupils who can adapt form and style to suit an audience? The dialogue between Colston and Wesley would be a good example of that. Have you seen where pupils can draw features from models of similar writing? Yes, the children who take the phrase, every tear was wiped away from the book of Revelation and use it in their new Grimsby poem are dependent on the writing of others, but creative in the way that they can do it. Can you see pupils who can add detail and expand ideas in depth? Do you remember the piece about Coventry Cathedral where the pupil worked their way through the examples of the, uh, the different ways in which the, the morning after the bombing raid, Christian people in Coventry began straight away to apply the idea of forgiveness, what had happened to the city. Can children link ideas across paragraphs with adverbials and repeated phrases? I think you saw some good examples there. For instance, the diary, a very moving diary, Mary writing about the death of her son, the crucifixion in the Christian community, the way in which she used uh, repeated ideas to make sense of the grief, the agony of uh, Mary's circumstance there. Uh, this one really refers to all of the different approaches that you've seen. Go right back to that one about uh, the Buddhist writing frame that you saw at the beginning of the webinar and see how the pupils can use uh, tables, columns to guide the reader, but also to guide the writer, to help the writer to get their thoughts into a good structure. You've seen some examples of dialogue. The best one probably is the Colston Wesley one and the conveyance of the idea, the character, and move the action of the narrative onwards there. Uh, that's well thought through. And did you see examples where pupils described a character, gave a setting, gave an atmosphere? Do you remember this phrase, long, long ago, when the Egyptians were building their pyramids? Some precision about that, isn't there? And some location and setting of the atmosphere. I've wanted to show you cases where young people write well about their own opinions, their judgments. And uh, the examples of that are too many to, to mention. We've given lots of examples of personal writing in which pupils expand the personal work. And it, it, in all of this, uh, when pupils have done a piece of writing, look at Nathan Hatch's example of the feeding of the 5,000 in Dunstable. That's an evaluation in itself, isn't it, of the writing that he's read from the Gospel account. And of course, lots of um, the reason why I'm giving you all these examples today is to encourage you to use some of them in modelling good work, good practice to children in your RE classroom. Far too often, we don't model in RE. We model endlessly in English. We show them, here's a good one. This is what a good one looks like. But in RE, we set a writing task and time is short, so we hurry on. I think there's a case for modelling in RE, very, very strong case. And I urge you to see how children's writing improves in the religious education context when you give them some good models to work on. I hope some of the examples I've given over the last hour do indeed provide you with models that you can use and share, tasks that you can use with your classes, with your pupils across the age of Oliver is 10, 
and he did some work about uh, the pacifist, the Christian World War I pacifist Owen Thomas. He told his story and uh, uh, Owen Thomas survived the war and in later life he was a Christian preacher. The task which the teacher gave, you see it's a speech bubble and it's not huge, so it's to write, if you like, a snippet from a sermon. And the Bible text for this sermon is from St. Paul, try to be perfect, listen to my advice, agree with one another, live in peace, the God of love and peace will be with you. Oliver has imagined Owen Thomas commenting on this verse uh, from his experience of being a World War I non-combatant, refusing to bear arms. Would Owen Thomas say something like this? Making peace is not easy. It takes love, friendship, positivity, not anger and pain. Following Jesus means trying to be peaceful. So try your hardest, be the best that you can. Forget about your differences and forget your past. Focus on your future. I think that it is wrong for Christians to hold guns because if we fight, we will disagree. Jesus made our religion. One question to think about is why does war come upon us? Why do humans have to fight? The, the only thing left to say is love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. I think there are some sophisticated ideas and some good lines of thought in Oliver's piece of writing. I like the way he's used quotations. He's applied ideas. He's made inferences. He's drawn conclusions. And Gracie's one is uh, another sophisticated piece of writing about, in this case, religion and science. She writes here uh, from the unit of work that she's done, uh, considering whether religion and science, the accounts of Genesis and the accounts of, of the origins of the universe that come from astrophysics or evolution, if those accounts are involved in an endless fight or whether there might be some uh, complementarity between the kinds of thinking that happen in religion and science. This is a very sophisticated piece of work when I used to teach secondary, I'd have been pleased to have had this piece of work from a year nine pupil, but Grace is in year six. She's done a whole unit of study on this, and she says, I've learned that creation and science can work together. Some people believe God created the Big Bang, and some believe it is showing the love and power of God. Some believe Genesis explains why the universe and life exists, and science explores how the universe works the way it does. Throughout our topic, we've thought about questions that science can't answer humans being made in the image of God. Jennifer Wiseman, a scientist who's what she studied, thinks that Genesis is not a literal account, it's not a scientific account. Many people are somewhere in the middle. Humans can have an amazing ongoing relationship with God. Some humans claim that. Genesis speaks the truth about humanity. Humans are created and dependent and imperfect, but full of potential. There are many scientists who are Christians and believe in God and science. Believing the discoveries in science makes them wonder more about the power of God that created them. You remember the point I made about children and youngsters expressing their own views with increasing depth and clarity. And in some ways, Grace is kind of positioning herself in the middle of some of these debates. She's not polarizing a view. As a result of the dialogues that she's encountered in the classroom, she can express the sophisticated understanding of a possible relationship between uh, scientific knowledge and religious insight. The seminar comes to an end with those two examples, a sermon about pacifism, uh, a debating point about religion and science. I've got these points I just want to make to you as a finish. First of all, that I do do whole school RE training or for a cluster of schools perhaps, and you can contact me later retoday.org.uk if you'd like to consider and plan a day of uh, CPD for your school staff. I work for NATRE, the National Association of Teachers of RE, and NATRE provides termly stimulus, uh, a magazine, a book every term, about 1,500 downloads on our website for all of our members. And you should join, you really should. One of the best ways to uh, spend your RE budget at NATRE. Every year we run the Spirited Arts competition. There's a web link to it. And uh, some of the best writing I see most years from religious education context comes from pupils who've made a work of art and written a description, uh, an analysis, uh, a, a thoughtful expression of what's in their work of art. So I'd really urge you to use the gallery there, uh, look it up, and get your pupils involved in next year's Spirited Arts competition. Here are my conclusions to the webinar today. I think that we need more opportunities for better, longer form writing in RE. I don't think those are actually very hard to identify. 
I think if you put them into action, they will raise the standards that your pupils can make use of in their religious education. There are some obstacles. Uh, teachers may feel short confidence. They may have too little time for RE. They may follow a textbook too closely, but those aren't obstacles that can't be overcome. We can get over those things. I have suggested that uh, three or four opportunities per year to write at length in RE would be a good target for year two, three, four, five, and six. Some of the longer form writing examples that I've shown you uh, would be good models of that kind of approach. And if you're watching this as the subject leader, perhaps your RE coordinator, RE lead, then you, you can be the key agent for better practice. You'll have to start that in your own classroom so that you can model it. And maybe through co-teaching and uh, working with colleagues to celebrate their successes in getting better longer form writing into the RE curriculum and uh, sharing pupil work around the staff room around the school and monitoring uh, what's going on in RE as you would do a subject leader anyway, particularly for new initiatives around pupil writing. Those who Colleagues, can I thank you for your time in uh, uh, sitting and thinking with me about the possibilities and potentialities of longer form writing in religious education. And can I urge you to make a note as the webinar concludes of the things which you want to do because of your thinking over the last hour and 10 minutes. The uh, presentation of the webinar uh, gives you lots and lots of examples. And of course, the purpose of the examples is not necessarily that you should copy them. Be an adopter, if you like, take them just as they are and run them in your own school. But most of you will probably be adapters. You'll have a look at the example and say, oh yeah, I liked that one, the, the one with the sermon in it, the one about the pacifist, I liked that. I'm not gonna do it. I'll do something better that I thought of myself. That Buddhist piece from that kitty in year two, that was really good. But we don't do Buddhism in year two. I'm going to adapt that to the Muslim or the Jewish tradition. Very best wishes to you as you pursue this agenda of enabling pupils to express themselves to high standards through their writing in religious education.